So glad to have you with us today. I believe that God is going to speak to your hearts. You know, this is such a pivotal time in which we are living. This is a moment that is historical. And so I just think that the Holy Spirit has so much to say. You know, we can get in the busyness of life and begin to accelerate and go with all the activity and the noise that's taking place in the world today. But you know what? I thank God that you've tuned in and you've carved out and made the Word of God a priority and spending time with Him, spending time with His Word. And as a result, I believe that it will bring forth a harvest and a tremendous outcome in your life. And so we just are so appreciative. Creflo and I are just thanking God for the fact that we can connect virtually and digitally. We can begin to see God still move in the Spirit. And so just agree with us today and just agree with me that that same anointing that's here with us is that same anointing that will be there with you. And then you'll hear, you'll understand, you'll comprehend, and you'll know what it is that God is speaking to your heart. So we're going to open up with prayer. And so if you would just bow your heads with me and Lord, we just thank you. I pray for every person watching. I ask that you will cause them to get revelation insight. May they know your love. May they understand and embrace what you called them to be and called them to do from the foundations of the world. We thank you for clarity in their lives. We thank you for the blessing upon their household. And we declare that all is well in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today we are going to talk about God's opinion. We know that there are so many opinions that are in the world today. People have an opinion just about every single thing. You know, whether it's cold, whether it's hot, whether it's black, whether it's white, whether it's, you know, it's just so many opinions. But you know what? I want us today to focus in on God's opinion and his opinion of you. And so, you know, last couple of times we've been talking about the God of the mountain and the valley. But today we're going to look at David's life, David's example. And then through his life, we'll understand some things and get some pivotal principles that I believe will be a blessing to your life. And so we're going to begin in 1 Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel. And primarily, we're going to look at the King James Version because this um, pivotal uh, story really amplifies the life of David and his relationship with Saul and the things that he went through as a man, someone who had a heart after God, as the scripture describes. And so, you know, these are things that I'm so thankful for because David was a man who was flawed. His humanity showed in so many ways, and we can benefit from his life. In fact, instead of us looking at 1 Samuel, let's look at Acts chapter 2 first, because his example and his life is still with us today. And so we can find that reference over in Acts chapter 2, verse 29. And so David, I love to study the lives and the characters in the Bible, both the old and the new. And so, you know, he had so much that he experienced, so many triumphs. There were tragedies that he experienced as well. He had his highs, he had his lows. He experienced the God of the mountain, the God of the valley in Psalms 23. I mean, that was the basis of his life. And so when we look at David, we understand that he was a man, as the Bible describes, was a man after God's own heart. And so the scripture in Acts 2, verse 29, references him. It says, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise 
of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth this, which you now hear and see. And so one of the things that we can understand about this scripture is the fact that David, unto this day, his life is still ministering to us. And so even in the book of Acts, the New Covenant, the New Testament, not just the fact that he was in the old, one of the patriarchs of old, but I'm telling you, he has a powerful story and a powerful life. And that's what we want to get in today as we look at God's opinion and God's view of you. So we see it referenced here. We're still being inspired by David's example 4,000 years later. Think of that. I don't know about you. It just speaks volumes when someone's life is referenced and still inspiring 4,000 years later. So when we look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, a couple of things we want to establish and lay as a foundation is that David was not God's first choice, yet God used him powerfully. And so many of you may think, well, you know, I don't know if I'm even chosen by God. I don't know if I have a plan for my life in God's master plan. But one thing we can understand is the fact that even though Saul made a lot of mistakes, Saul got into a place where he disobeyed God and did things that God didn't tell him to do. David was the one that God chose as a result of Saul's decision, and God used David powerfully. So it doesn't really matter um, the fact that David was not God's first choice because God chose David. And then the scripture goes on and talks about how, you know, God was more interested in David because of his availability and not so much his ability. And so look with me over in 1 Samuel chapter 15, and we can look at verse 13. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 13, and we'll read down through verse 17. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be the Lord Blessed be of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. So this is what Saul is saying after um, there were instructions that were given to him. And Samuel says uh, in verse 14, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? So in other words, if you have performed the commandment of the Lord, then why, Samuel's asking Saul, why am I hearing these things? And Saul said in verse 15, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people. He taught, started referring the, to the people. For the people spare the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. But you know what? That isn't what he was given to do. That wasn't the assignment, the task that he was supposed to carry out. And so Samuel called him on the carpet concerning that. And so Saul began to point the finger and say, it's the people. And then the rest um, we destroy. But, you know, there were other things that he was supposed to do concerning taking and owning the responsibility, not sparing the things, but destroying everything. And then in verse 16, then Samuel said unto Saul, stay, I will tell you, or I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, say on. And Samuel said, when thou was little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And so Samuel challenges Saul and says, when you were little in your own eyes, you were willing to do the things that God called you to do. But he calls Saul on the carpet because Saul began to get the big head, as we call it. His head started to swell in terms of the things about himself. And so Samuel says, when you were little, when you were small in your own eyes and you reference God as being big and his plan being more important than your own plan, he says, then you were exalted. But then he says, uh, what happened? And he uh, challenges him in the fact that, 
he no longer saw himself as small and humble. And so as a result, Saul did not do what he was assigned to do. Saul did not carry out what the task was for his life. And so it is in the life of David that David, as a result, had to step up. And David was God's um, replacement, if you will, for Saul, is how some of the scriptures reference in other translations, because David was not God's first choice. And so, you know, it was Saul's heart that um, was not yielded to the plan of God, and as a result, it opened the door to him not doing what God has said to do. And so when we look at this area, we have to understand uh, the importance of us understanding and knowing um, the plan for God, and the plan is more important that we carry it out. So David's own family did not even see his potential. When we look over in chapter 16 and we look at the conversation that David had with his siblings, he was assigned to be out with the sheep and he was the shepherd over the sheep. And so his brothers, particularly Eliab, his older brother, had a problem with David coming down when there was the task of fighting Goliath. And so when we look at chapter 16, uh, look at verse 6. It says, And they came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So this uh, young man Eliab was David's brother, and so those who were being evaluated to go to war and to face Goliath, he was the one who they thought would be assigned and have God's grace and God's favor upon them based on, you know, his height, his stature, his age, all these things, as it describes here in verse 6, was the one who they thought would be anointed. And then it says, but the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the the height of his stature because I have refused him. God says, I have refused Eliab. He says here, "Uh, because I have refused him for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So all the brothers were determining who would be most qualified, whose anointing would be uh, in the position to promote, to elevate, to exalt. And they thought it would be Eliab. But Samuel said, absolutely not. That is not the case. Because you guys are looking on the outward, but the Lord is looking on the heart. And so we must understand that God saw David's heart. God looks on the inside, so we need to keep this in mind when we're evaluating other people. God did not see uh, as man saw just the outward things. And so, you know, people will have their opinions concerning you. They'll evaluate many times based on the external things. But you know what? Thank God that he looks on the inward. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 16, chapter 16, verse 9. And then we're going to look back at this um, story here with David. Because I want us to understand today God's view of us. And um, when we understand his view, then we won't be moved and limited by other people's view of us. Because people will look on your talent. Well, you don't have the talent. You're not sharp enough. You don't have the look. You don't have the background. You don't have the education. You don't have the right pedigree. All these things in the natural are the means by which man chooses. 
But thank God, there's a different category and there's a different criteria when it comes to the things of God. So let's look at 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. And let's look at verse 9 here. It says, uh, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Whose heart is perfect. God's looking for the purpose who has the right heart. He's looking for the person whose heart is yielded towards him. Yielded towards his plan. David was out there in the field with the sheep, with the bear, with the lion, and his heart was in a place where he trusted that God would give him the victory. As God gave him the victory to deal and overcome the lion, the bear, all those things out there because his heart was shifted towards God and trusting God. And so the scripture says here in verse 9 that the eyes of the Lord are running all over throughout the whole earth looking for those whose heart is not flawless, but whose heart is yielded, whose heart is pure, who has a motive to want to please God, a motive to want to establish the covenant of God in their lives. And so it is, child of God, we have to make up in our minds and not allow how other people see us, other people's opinions of us. David's own family didn't even think that he had potential, but you know what? It didn't matter. And so it is even in your own family. There may be siblings in your family, in your life who look down upon you, don't think certain things that you can do, but you know what? Don't pay attention to that. Be like David. Hear God and yield your heart to him. Look at, um, we turn back here to 1 Samuel chapter 16, and I want us to understand this concerning uh, David's life, and he didn't allow the criticism and the negativity of his siblings and of his family to limit his potential and to limit the things that uh, needed to be done at the time. And so we read on and we understand that David was being chosen to be the king and um, it was a wonderful privilege and a wonderful opportunity that he had had. So in chapter 16, verse 18, it says, Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. That is cunning and playing and a mighty, a mighty valiant man and a man of war and prudent in manners, matters and a comely person. And you know what he says? The Lord is with him. Think of that. So um, there were those who were, you know, uh, in other places. There were others who were sons. But you know what? They recognized and they were seeking out the replacement for Saul and it was referencing David here which was the son of Jesse the Bethlehemite and that he was um, the scripture says one who played skillfully and he was valiant and he was prudent and eloquent and he was an attractive person the scripture says the Lord was with him so we must understand that we cannot allow the criticism of others to get us off track and cause us to get into a place of argumentative and just strife and contention and things like that. So when we look in chapter 17 in David's life and God's opinion of David, we see here Eliab, his oldest brother. Look at this in verse 28. Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why came you down hither, and with whom hast thou left these few sheep? And so he was throwing a little shade at David. He was belittling the assignment that David had. Why are you coming down here, little brother? Why? You know, you're just, you know, sometimes youngest baby brothers and baby sisters can be the pest or the one who kind of is in the midst. And maybe you, at that time, they didn't want David around. You know, we're all doing, you know, big brother adult stuff. And, you know, David was 17, considered around a pretty, you know, teenager at the time. So they were trying to say, why? Why are you here? Why did you come down here? You're supposed to be with the sheep. 
And so Eliab, uh, he was upset and he was angry. The scripture said his anger was kindled against David. And he said, why came, camest thou down hither? And with whom have you left those few sheep? And uh, I know your pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For you art come down that thou mightest see the battle. So they just didn't want him around. He said, you know, you, you, you just being nosy. You're sticking your nose in something that you don't need to be a part of. This is, uh, m this is men's responsibility. This is the big, you know, brother's responsibility. David, you're just uh, being annoying. You're being aggravating. You're getting on our nerves. And just go back and tend to the sheep, the few sheep. And so this is what David says in verse 29. David says, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? What have I now done? Why am I being um, uh, pointed at or the finger being the one who's chosen to be uh, the irritant at the time? He says, is there not a cause? And so we have to look at our lives because David saw the opportunity to carry out the cause of God and to carry out the cause of Christ. While there were so many, as we uh, were to read back in earlier verses here, they were so afraid of Goliath. You know, Goliath had them all intimidated. Goliath had them all shivering and shaking. And, and uh, Goliath walked down, you know, he came down. And as he walked, every move he made, they all, David's brothers, were just terrified. And so when David came down and he saw Goliath there, he didn't respond and see uh, this big giant who would destroy him or defeat him or kill him. He saw it as an opportunity for God to be glorified, for God's covenant to be established. He saw it as an opportunity to magnify the Lord and make God bigger than the giant and to exalt the, God, the presence of God. And so it was in verse 29 that David says, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason? And then, you know, he was motivated by that. And so as a result, he overcame the criticism. And so it is in your life, child of God, when you make up a decision that you're going to live for God, that you're going to obey God, that you're going to do what God is calling you to do, people will be critical. People will say all kinds of things because you know what? They don't want to be challenged with where they are. They don't want to uh, have to be questioned about what they're not doing. It's much easier for David to have just gone back to where the sheep were and stay where, you know, the things that he was assigned to do as opposed to challenging his family, challenging his brothers to do something that had not been done. And so it is in our lives. We have to understand that there is an enemy and there are those who want to be critical. There are those who see themselves as small, see themselves as unable and unqualified, inefficient. Um, and as a result, they want to shriek you and cause you to just kind of stay where they are. But thank God for David, that he was a man after God's heart and he had the covenant on his mind and he was willing to overcome the criticism. So David viewed other things, including giants, the way that God saw them. God did not, Goliath did not stand a chance as far as David was concerned. Goliath was someone who would be defeated. And that he would be one who would be um, made a mockery by challenging the covenant of Almighty God. So what was it that made David different? Was it his training? No, because he didn't have any. Was it his combat knowledge from being in the military? No, because he'd never gone to the military. It was his heart. It was his inner thoughts, his motive. And that was the thing that made him different. Because, you know, in comparison to Eliab and the other ones, they were the ones who had been trained and had been prepared and knowledgeable and had certain skills. But you know what? They were afraid. And as a result of their fear, they uh, were intimidated by Goliath. And so we must understand that David's, ability was 
uh, contingent on the covenant of God. Now look at this in, in uh, verse 26. So he says, um, And David spoke to the man that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He says, that he should defy the armies of the living God. See, David had covenant on his mind. And we've got to have covenant on our mind. We've got to think covenant when it comes to the things of God and God's plan for our lives and God's opinion of us. I am a child of God. I'm a daughter of Abraham. I'm the seed of Abraham. And what God's promises are belong unto me. So come hell or high water, I'm in it for the long haul. I've seen the things that he's done in my private life. And so if this is the moment where God needs to be glorified in my public life, I'm prepared and I'm ready to do it. And so it was David's mindset. It was David's decision that he was going to be the one who would face the giant in his life. Because it didn't matter how tall Goliath was, he knew how big and how powerful and how tall God was. And it didn't matter whether or not he had been trained in the military and had combat knowledge and combat skill. Why? Because he had defeated the lion in private. He says, I defeated the bear. So he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would dare defy? the armies of the living God. And so it was that David stood strong. And then in verse 27, so the people and the people answered him after this manner saying, so shall it be, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. So David's attitude, and that's the thing. I know attitudes are all over the place right now. Thinking that uh, one way is going to, you know, take us backwards and another way is going to move us forward. And what is the attitude of God? And so David's heart was towards God and his attitude was in line with the things of God. And he saw things differently from everyone else. His attitude was totally different to the point that he was operating in faith. They were operating in fear. They were in a spirit of criticism and self-criticism. And so we have to be like David and understand that uh, we cannot allow circumstances to question or intimidate the plan of God for our lives. So look over at um, what happened and so make a long story short we know um, that through verse 34 down through uh, 46 uh, David fought Goliath in verse 47 and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And so that was the thing. It was an opportunity, child of God, that this battle that was real, we're not saying that, you know, it wasn't a battle. This was a real battle. You have battles in your life, but much more, Real than the battles in your life is your victory that is assured and guaranteed in the midst of it. And so David was mindful of the fact that this is the Lord's battle. And this is about the covenant of God. And then even in verse 46, he says that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And you better believe it. After David fought Goliath, and he went around and got the knife and cut his head off. People knew 
Whoa. You mean to tell me this little teenage guy, this little scrawny kid, that he defeated this nine, ten foot giant? That got their attention. People started listening and looking and saying, well, maybe there is something to what this guy is doing. He hadn't been out there with us and training and gone to military school and gotten all the discipline with the skills and so forth and so on. But you know what? It's because God knew his heart and God got involved and caused his grace and caused his anointing to be upon his life. And so it is in your life, child of God, that once we make a quality decision, that there'll be nothing that will stop us from being defeated. So David had confidence to fight Goliath because he had been faithful in smaller things. Think of that. Faith has to grow and to increase in our lives. Not to say that you just jump up and do the most um, huge, outrageous things. But you know, David, like I said, he fought, dealt with things in the sheep, in the field, being as a shepherd over them, and then his faith grew. His faith developed. Look at Mark chapter 4, verse 28. Because having faith, it must be developed, and it must begin on the smaller things. I'm telling you, when you get that cough or feel like you're getting symptoms of maybe the virus or whatever, that's when you want to start speaking and declaring. You don't want to wait until, you know, you're in ICU or, in, you know, going under that you start believing God. No, take advantage of the smaller things and then your faith will grow and your faith will increase. And so it says here, um, uh, Verse 26 says, so is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear. After that, the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle, because... The harvest is come. And so through experience, through revelation, we will begin to understand how to develop in our faith. And you know what? It will command respect for the outside world. When David developed revelation of God being a deliverer, of God strength coming on his life, in his private life, then when he stepped onto the scene right there in front of Goliath, it commanded respect from his brothers and from his family and all of those who were there watching. And so it is in our lives, we have to know who we are. We must know the power of the word, that that word gives us the ability to have dominion. And that word has to be exercised and our authority has to be released in our everyday lives. It has to be spoken, has to be acted upon, has to be meditated on. We must get a revelation of it. And once we get a revelation of it, how many of you know our opinion of ourselves will begin to change and it'll grow on the inside of who we are. I'm the apple of his eye. I'm the chosen. I'm the beloved. God loves me with an undying, unfailing, unconditional love. He wants to do me good and make me happy. I am his prized possession. I'm the focus of all of his delight. When we get this opinion of who we are and how he sees us on the inside of him, of us, then I'm telling you, there's no demon in hell that'll be able to stop us and pull us back. And so David wasn't perfect, neither are we perfect. Jesus is our completion. And so we understand that we are complete in him. God sees us through Jesus. It is his blood that enables us to exercise and operate in the authority and the dominion of God. And so I just pray today, as we bring this to a close, that you'll know 
without a shadow of a doubt how vital it is for you to remain humble and for you to remain dependent on God. Remaining humble and remaining dependent on God. And you know what David did? He had to encourage himself in the Lord. And so it is in our everyday lives when we tune in to the opposition, we have to steal away and be encouraged by the word and not allow all these other things to have root and take seed in our life and to know God's view is more important than anybody else's view. Bow your heads with me and let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the word of God today. We thank you. I pray that the word of God has fallen upon good ground and it will bring forth fruit in the lives of every person that is watching today. I pray, Lord, that they'll get such a conviction, such an understanding of the fact that you believe in us and your plan is great concerning us, plans to prosper us and give us a future that you do not abandon us, Lord, but you take care of us. And as a result, we can trust, lean, rely, and depend on you. So help us, Lord, to continue to stay humble in your eyes, humble in your sight, so that we, Lord, like Saul, won't get into a place of disobedience and falling short, but help us, Lord, like David, to yield our hearts unto you a heart that is yielded to your plan and to your purpose so that we can do those things that will glorify you and cause great influence in the earth. So we thank you for the victory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you're not born again, that's the most important thing to do is to receive Jesus as your Lord and as your personal Savior. I'm telling you, that's the most important decision that I could have made when I was in college, just crazy, reckless, all kinds of things. But there was something that was empty in my life, something that uh, partying couldn't feel, something that drugs couldn't feel. It was only the presence of God. And so it is until we accept Jesus into our lives. God won't be able to fully express his love and his plan for our lives. And so, you know, you can continue to search, continue to hunt, continue to pursue everything else to try to fill that void. But I'm telling you, there's nothing like God moving on the inside. And when his presence comes on the inside of us, I'm telling you, child of God, you will know that you have been changed from the inside out. And so all we have to do is just let him come in. Welcome him. Welcome his presence. Give him the opportunity and accept his invite to come into and cause your life to be changed. So I want to pray a simple prayer that say this with me, Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Because Jesus died, I can be born again, free from the penalties of sin. I thank you that the penalty and the charges have been taken care of through the blood of Jesus. And because of Jesus, I believe that I'm born again. In Jesus' name, it's just that simple. I'm telling you, welcome to the family of God. Heaven is rejoicing. We are rejoicing for your decision to receive Christ into your life. So all you have to do is text, I'm saved, to 51555. We want to share some things with you. We know how important it is to get the right foundation in your life, to get on the right path, how to stay on that path so you can grow and mature and develop and increase and become like David and flourish and thrive in the things of God. And it'll be our privilege to be able to share those things with you. Before we leave today, let's give you the opportunity to sow, to put seed in the ground. You know what? I know that there are so many things that are trying to negate and contradict the benefit of sowing to God and believing God and even having a relationship with God. 
in this day and time, people don't believe in prayer, don't believe in going to church, don't believe in reading their Bible, don't believe in walking in love. We live in a time of such lawlessness, lasciviousness, rebellion, all kinds of things. So you know what? We have to seek ye first the kingdom of God, God's way of doing things, his way of being right. That's what it says over in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek ye first, inquire, strive after, pursue the kingdom, the way in which the king wants us to live, his system of operation, not the world system of operation. You know, the world says, get all you can and can all you get. No, that's not God's way of thinking. And so we have to renew our minds and we have to recognize that we are part of the kingdom. And then part of our responsibility as a citizen of heaven and citizen of God is knowing how to conduct our financial affairs and inviting and involving God in this financial realm. Because he wants to be involved in every area of our life, not just spiritually coming in and moving into your spirit and causing your spirit to become alive, but he wants to be involved in your physical life, your body, um, your body operating and carrying out what it was designed to do from the foundations of the world, flowing, working, functionings like it should, and organs and everything lining up. So emotionally, he wants to be involved in your affairs, financially, spiritually, socially, every area of life pertaining to man kind is where God wants to be involved. So sow today and get the seed into the ground because he says if we seek him first and everything else will be added to him. But so many times we may seek him last and then we wonder why things aren't working in our life and why, you know, it seems to be the last thing that is um, given uh, any attention is because we put him last and so consequently we're not seeing anything but when we put him first he causes us to see his manifestation first and foremost in our lives so thank you so much you can sow by giving via text uh, you can give by calling the number that's there on your screen you can send it in via mail but by all means get it in the ground and it is our prayer that what you sow will come back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I pray that you are blessed. And don't forget to remind yourself and to remember that God loves me, and that's his opinion of me. God bless you.